Okay, if you're here to see removing the human single point of failure in the right place. I'm Tim Wilfong, and this is Justin. Hi. And I think you start. So, um, Tim and I are from, uh, we're from a company called Picnic, uh, Picnic.com. Uh, actually, we were just acquired by Google. Uh, we'll get to that later. Um, but first of all, what is Picnic? Um, Picnic is, is actually a pretty popular application. It's a browser-based photo editor. Uh, lives, again, completely in your browser, and we have connections to all sorts of other sites, Facebook, uh, Flickr, MySpace, of course, Picasa Web. Um, we have millions of users. Um, our front end is pretty much Flash, um, and we have a, uh, a pretty standard Linux uh, LAMP stack on the back end. Uh, we're based out of Seattle. Um, and we use uh, various cloud providers for overflow and additional storage capacity and all that fun stuff. Uh, it looks something like that. Um, we have cute frogs. We like frogs. Yeah, and this is an example of uh, editing in Picnic. Uh, one of the effects we have, we have hundreds of effects, and we're not going to go through demoing the product. Uh, but just to say that uh, Picnic is a fast, fun, easy to use, and powerful set of photo editing tools. It runs in your web browser, and it's, again, it's free to use, all the basic features. So if you haven't used it before, check it out, picnic.com. Our marketing folks will be happy that I mentioned that. So I've been at Picnic for about three years, which pretty much goes back to the very beginning of the company. Um, I was brought in because I was the only person that the founders knew, being a bunch of ex-Microsoft people, that knew anything about Linux. And they had decided somehow that they were going to build their entire stack, their entire world on Linux, even though they had not a clue how to actually do any of that. So they brought me in to kind of set them on the, on the straight and narrow. Uh, and then I gradually morphed into doing a fair amount of uh, the back end development, all of our file system, uh, just file system, metadata, uh, REST layer, all that stuff I was handling. And I was also taking on operations, because once again, I was the only person that knew their way around the command prompt. Um, we knew very early on that we'd probably start using cloud providers. Um, and we were a little bit at the front edge of that. But you know, it turns out these are actually pretty good design choices anyway. If you design with that in mind, it makes your life easy going, on, going forward. And we also knew that we needed to monitor the shit out of everything. And we need to have automation to make our lives easier. And it turns out, actually, that these things... Uh, helped us grow significantly uh, and really reduce the pain and actually allowed me to be the only ops person for all of Picnic up until uh, not too long ago. Um, and so we had you know, nearly, we were well over 10 million uniques before, monthly uniques before we even thought about bringing in someone else. Uh, again, automation, cloud providers, all that stuff. Which uh, brings us to the juggler on the screen there. Uh, so basically you can a uh, single person can handle uh, h handle automation just like a good juggler can handle keeping many balls in the air. Uh, a really good engineer can keep a system with lots of element operating uh, for, for quite a while on their own, uh, especially if they're a total rock star like Justin here. Um, but, you know, sooner or later, uh, that changes. And then the balls come tumbling down and everyone is sad. And unfortunately, we should have a, a, a big sad cat like the last presenter, but we don't. Uh, well, we, sh we should also mention here uh, briefly uh, that uh, one of the reasons that Justin was able to uh, get as far as he was uh, with picnic operations is because it, it actually wasn't quite a one-man show. Um, Mike, our co-founder, kind of was also taking on some of the operation stuff, but he was, he was not in it day to day, right? He was the COO, he's busy making decisions, doing management type stuff, meeting in the corner office in the conference room, tying that up all day. And so he wasn't actually involved in the day to day operations of the site, which sounds, it, 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 on the surface, when you're in the middle of it, it seems okay. Okay, he can step in, we can have discussions, technical discussions, we can make decisions, but when the shit hits the fan, he really wasn't ready to step up. He didn't have the skill set because he wasn't completely immersed in it every day, all day. And so that brings me to my next point. Basically, uh, even if your backup has all the right skills or is highly technical, 
if they aren't immersed in the day-to-day -day operations, uh, or at least uh, taking you know frequent and regular turns at operations, uh, their skills or knowledge might be stale, or they might not just have the immediate things at their fingertips, that, that, that knowledge to uh, deal with issues. So that can be problematic if disaster strikes, and uh, this kind of backup is a slight mitigation of risk, but it's only a slight mitigation of risk. Never forget that humans are actually part of the system you're building. Uh, I mean, just as much as the servers, just as much as your IP transit links, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. There's still the human in the loop. And uh, humans, uh, humans can fail, and you should be aware of that, and you should plan for that. And uh, you, know, you just do your, your risk analysis, and you realize that, that when something does go wrong, um, you know, and by go wrong, I mean, the, say, the human wants to take a vacation. I like vacations every so often. Uh, <laughs> even better, I like to take vacations where there's no cell service. <laughs> and so when you come back in the cell service and your pager's going off and your boss is trying to get a hold of you, that's, that's not good. <laughs> so just remember that humans fail and you should plan for that. For example, one failure is complete failure, uh, which leads us to what we like to call the fire engine test. We've heard of the bus test, but we didn't like it. Very similar to the bus test. Uh, as much as possible, this test should apply to every major element of the system and every person involved in those elements. So for example, uh, we have two single points of failure. If one engineer knows about the routers and the other knows about the database, and they don't have any overlap in knowledge. So what you need is good overlap and good documentation. Uh, otherwise, you've just created multiple single points of failure. Um, basically, this, this talk is focused on operations, uh, so we won't go into how uh, the fire engine rule applies to basically every person in the company, sales, uh, you know, uh, business people, everything. Uh, we won't go into that. Uh, uh, but let me uh, touch on developers a bit. If you lose a developer, the other developers need to know enough about the system to uh, you know, be able to pick up where that developer left off. Uh, so the fire engine test is a, a good test and it applies to everybody. So we also have temporary failures, like we talked. Um, we have vacations. Uh, we have simply people getting overloaded. Um, and we just, people get tired. Um, you know, it's just all sorts of ways that a human can fail. And hopefully we should try to avoid those. Um, you know, we can think of all sorts of uh, very interesting failure cases for humans. Uh, maybe even analogies to our Nagios pages. Uh, what would a flapping human look like? I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, we don't have a graphic of that, so we'll spare all of you that we misery. Looked, we looked, couldn't find one. We did look. We looked really, really hard. Uh, uh, in addition to redundancy from, from extra humans uh, in the system, um, it's not just all about redundancy. Extra eyes can reduce the risk of mistakes and result in improved designs and plans. And uh, just, just kind of the importance of being able to bounce ideas off someone else, you know, just being able to turn around and you know, say, hey, what do you think of this? Uh, even if it's just for a sanity check, that can't be discounted. And the, the mitigation of risk that that brings with it uh, shouldn't be discounted either. Um, these intangibles are uh, every bit as important as being able to pass that uh, fire engine test that we just mentioned. So, right, okay, we shouldn't, we shouldn't ignore the human single point of failure. We actually probably need to hire new people at some point. Um, however, humans are actually kind of expensive. Um, you know, for for a, a bag of saline with feet and arms, uh, we actually cost quite a bit. And we probably cost more than robots or maybe even monkeys. Uh, so when do, we, when do we actually want to expand the team? It, it turns out that that question is pretty critical, um, even before you think of the benefits or, the, uh, um, or you know, how you're even going to hire this person. So when we started out, again, I was wearing all sorts of hats. and. You might, uh, you, you might, some, uh, some developers, some, some startups are actually playing the game where uh, you have, uh, uh, everyone is responsible for the operation of the site. 
And that works really well um, as long as you're still following these basic rules and that, that, uh, that everyone is aware of everyone else's duties or at least enough of it you have full coverage if you lose people for whatever reason. Um, and that's a perfectly valid way of expanding the team. It turned out that pretty much everyone at Picnic, with the exception of Mike and I, had really no interest in being paged late at night. And they had families and, and lots of other reasons, but the culture we had built didn't allow us to take that path. So although we had plenty of people available, um, it was actually going to be kind of hard for us to expand the ops team without actually hiring another person to, to sit in that chair. Um, so at some point, your one person is going to have trouble keeping their head above water. And it's probably a good idea that you actually expand the team before that person drowns. Um, because then you've just committed your failure and then you have someone else to train and that's, that's just not good. <laughs> yeah, you don't, you don't want to be that lizard right there. Uh, but another benefit of hiring that second person early is that they basically they get involved in the system uh, and in the design uh, of the system and they have buy into that system before things get out of control. So the longer you have a one person's team, the harder it becomes uh, to transition to a two person team uh, or the longer that transition will take. So you know, I'm not saying that you don't keep that one person team as long as it makes sense, but just uh, keep in mind that, that the longer that, that that exists, the harder it is to make this transition. And so hiring that person a little earlier than you think you need them uh, is a good idea. Yeah, and they need to be trained um, and, uh, and all that. Um, there's, the, the timing question is, uh, is a tough one, and it can be really hard to convince people. Um, maybe you can go find a VC to get more money or something like that. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, but uh, you definitely want to want to have that person ready when you, when you need them, for sure. Yeah. OK, so sooner is better, right? Uh, but uh, budgets are limited. And uh, especially if you're bootstrapped like Picnic was, you don't want to go out to VCs and get extra money. Uh, so budgets are limited. And startups are about taking risk. We're used to taking risks, and we get ahead because we're willing to take certain risks. So what is an acceptable risk? Uh, uh, risk associated with a human single point of failure can be acceptable for a while, and, and, and just like we accept other risks, we can accept that risk. So the trick is deciding when the risk is not acceptable anymore. Uh, and one factor is the cost of uh, downtime. You can look at how much downtime costs, and as soon as that uh, gets too much, that becomes... Uh, no longer an acceptable risk. Uh, so it's a, it's a big factor, but there's more factors than that. Another is how lucky you've been so far, right? If you've been pretty lucky and nothing's happened and you've been up or you haven't had any public downtime, uh, you can probably take that risk a little longer. Uh, if you've had public downtime already or uh, you've had uh, people who have noticed that you've been down, then, then uh, the risk becomes less acceptable, uh, particularly if you want people to actually use your service. Um, so there's definitely a cost, risk, benefit trade-off here, and your mileage may vary. Uh, but just make sure the stakeholders and decision makers in charge of the money have a good understanding of what the risks are so they can make an informed decision about you know, what is acceptable risk and when's the right time to make that change. You can always just leave it on an unexpected vacation and just see how that flies. <laughs> you may lose your, your job, though. Um, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but make sure when you hire this person, you don't simply split the duties down the middle. Um, that's just, then you just have two single points of failure, and that just doesn't make sense at all. So again, make sure you have overlap um, and cross-training, so, uh, so that when, you know, at least, it, you know, like, perhaps I handle our BGP routing. Tim doesn't need to be an expert in that, but at least he should know how to fix a l large class of problems when something happens or be able to turn down the transfer provider when we need to. Yep. Right, or if the new person comes in and implements a bunch of new uh, features, they need to make sure that they are training the old people and how those features work. Uh, we had that problem. 
when Tim came in, he, uh, he, he completely upgraded our network, and then I had no clue how to run it anymore. <laughs> so when we talk about hiring, uh, skill overlap is, in, or not overlap, um, is, uh, is an important consideration. You want to hire someone that's, you have a common base so that you can at least communicate, but you don't want to hire an identical person because you're actually trying to broaden your skills as a team um, rather than just complement, um, you know, and everyone is, uh, is just uh, uh, complementing each other rather than, rather than expanding. Um, you also want to hire someone that you're going to get along with uh, because chances are you're going to spend a bunch of time with them, and uh, if you really hate their guts, it's not going to be pretty. And it's going to end badly, and, and uh, that's no good. Someone will probably just end up leaving the company. Yeah, we don't want to see that. Yeah, no. <laughs> Sorry, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's also kind of hard to hire it just finding people. Jo ask John Elspa. He's been trying to hire someone for Etsy for, I don't know, like months. I'd, um, if you want to work in New York, call John. Um, he's really desperate. Uh, he, he also did a blog post um, with some help from... Uh, from Jesse Robbins on actually how to interview for ops positions. It turns out that's kind of a hard thing to do because what we all do is so varied that uh, developing an interview question is much harder than interviewing, say, for a developer or for a support person. So, <laughs> um, I did, got a little bit ahead of myself. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we, we searched quite a while. Uh, we were probably searching for this guy for a good six months um, before we found him. And it didn't help that we were searching for the wrong person. Um, I'm a developer by trade, and I got into ops because I think it's kind of fun. So our initial job description was... He's weird like that. Yeah. <laughs> You're at a sysadmin <laughs> conference. Uh, and so uh, we were actually looking for vaguely a clone of myself. Um, which we already decided was a really bad idea, but we didn't know that at the time. So our initial job description actually, as a requirement, had strong C++. Um, it turns out that's not a very clear, it's not a very good requirement for an ops position. It's useful, um, but again, we were trying to hire a developer that would be interested in ops. And we decided to change that up a little bit and search for an ops person that had interest in doing development. Because the fact is, our systems were automated very heavily using a whole bunch of code. Well, that's what developers do. Developers write code. So in now, nowadays, today's sysadmin world, ops world, we're all writing code. And if we aren't, we're probably doing something wrong. So you need to find someone that has that type of skills, uh, but they don't necessarily need to be a developer first. Right, so it did, it did help that I had a development background, uh, and it was good that, that uh, Picnic was arriving at this decision that, that although that's important, that wasn't the uh, most important thing, uh, which basically let me kind of slide in under the door. Uh, and uh, being uh, an ops guy, and, and basically an ops guy for 10 years, uh, but having a development background helped. Uh, and we kind of it continued to flip it around more. We're, we're, we're having that some, someone who is a, a more experienced uh, ops person in the door to sort of complement Justin's skills uh, and also be able to do some overlap, so have some development skills as well uh, was important. It helps uh, to be able to speak the same language. Speaking the same language is, is key. Uh, and so, again, like I said before, your mileage may vary, but uh, this overlapping skill theme that you're hearing is, is very important. Uh, and, uh, you know, with things like Chef and other automation tools that are coming out, development is also very important for off guys now, too. Um. So, I built the back end for Picnic. I built the ops st side of it. I put the servers in the freaking racks. I ran all the cables. I made all the decisions, most of the decisions. Um, and then this crazy new guy comes in, and I actually found myself having to step back and kind of take a deep breath when Tim starts telling me that I'm doing it all wrong. And that, Not all wrong. Well, mostly wrong, maybe. Um, and so as, the, as the, the original person, as the person that, that is being expanded upon, it's actually kind of important that you realize that this other, this other person, Tim, is coming in with a completely different 
maybe not completely, but a very different worldview. Um, he's worked at other companies. Um, he has actually a lot more ops background. And uh, his ideas are perfectly valid. And uh, that actually goes both ways. Tim needs to realize that I was making decisions that I felt were right at that moment. And there's no right or wrong decisions in this industry. Well, maybe a couple. Um, <laughs> but uh, you, should, uh, you should realize that it's a two-way street. And that every, no decision, A, no decision is sacred, and you really shouldn't get hung up on any of this. You just kind of need to relax and just take it in stride and be able to sit down, turn around your chairs, because hopefully you're actually sitting close together, and have a discussion, a very frank discussion, about the merits of any single choice you've made, be it network gear, be it your configuration management system, be it how you handle deploys, any of that stuff. Really be open. This is a beautiful time to be open to new ideas and new ways of doing things. And you just kind of have to check your ego at the door. And I, I should mention that I was actually very impressed when I started at Picnic. Uh, I was expecting uh, yeah, things to, uh, having to uh, step in and, you know, put out fires that uh, weren't really there. So uh, uh, Justin did a really good job before I, I came in. And uh, I think he did a good job of checking your ego at the door, too. <laughs> um, OK. so. Let's not forget about automation, right? Because just because you have more people uh, doesn't mean you want to create uh, a meat cloud to uh, steal a phrase from somebody else. Um, you still need to automate. Automate, automate, automate. And uh, more people lets you build better automation. And yes, you get the benefit of those people when things go wrong. But automation is still really, really important. Uh, and getting more done with less people is one reason uh, that you know, Picnic, for example, was able to get as far as it, it was with one person. But hey, let's try to get really far with two people. You know, uh, uh, let's let's not back off on automating. Um, and more importantly, there's there's other things that automation does. It it makes sure that processes uh, are consistent, and in by enshrining them in the code that you're using to to create that automation. Um, uh, um, another thing is, uh, let's talk about being proactive for a minute. Uh, you want your ops team to be proactive, not reactive. So automation is proactive. Uh, you have to plan. You have to improve your monitoring. You have to decide how you're going to automate things. You have to talk about scenarios and you know, automate uh, your responses to those scenarios. Um, so besides increasing reliability and maintainability of your system, uh, Automation is 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 cool because it puts you in this proactive mode, which is usually more fun than being in a reactive mode. Although there's a couple of weird people out there who maybe like getting woken up in the middle of the night by a pager. Show of hands, anyone? Anyone? <laughs> Didn't think so. Okay. Uh, so uh, another thing that's really important uh, is documentation, and actually, uh, automation in code is a, a form of documentation. You're documenting processes by coding them. Uh, other kinds of documentation are really important. Uh, start with key information and then you know, expand. So, so hopefully, uh, your team is spending its time automating, documenting, thinking of how to improve the system, and being proactive instead of reactive. Uh, put together a run book that will allow some, a new person that you may hire to come in. And uh, as long as they have the right you know, background or right skill set, they can just read that run book and respond to emergencies. They know exactly what to do when, when system A goes down or when you know, this particular service goes down. They're, they look it up in the run book, bam, this is what I need to do. Now, you can automate a lot of those responses, but you still should have this, this run book that describes exactly what's going to happen. That's just one example of documentation. So you know, it's important to document the state of the system, network design, that kind of thing, but also document the reasons why you made the decisions that you did. So you know, if you want to change them later, you, can, you don't have to remember, well, why did we design it that way? Uh, you know it's documented. Uh, and uh, that also, another important point is to put notes like what maybe what your future plans might be. So you kind of know what you're thinking when you go back. Documentation is probably my biggest failing uh, when I was working on this stuff. It's pretty much, I think, for all of us, about the first thing that goes out the door when we're busy, and I was pretty busy. 
So the first thing that Tim did, besides upgrading the network, uh, was, uh, was documenting. And that was actually a really great learning experience um, for all of us because it actually forced us to revisit a lot of these decisions and perhaps revisit them in a way that was more constructive than, no, that's a bad way of doing that. You should have done it this other way. And then you get in a big fight and it's, yeah, not good. So, um, like I said earlier, I consider myself more of a developer, and uh, I actually used to do embedded systems design. So, going from embedded systems and really small stuff to really big stuff has been an interesting change, and we should all be ready for change. Um, so, just as I found myself doing ops, um, you know, we should all be ready to handle either a new person coming in or, um, or, or whatnot. Shortly before we hired Tim, I was actually really, I'm also a networking geek, so I was looking really excited to building out this cool new 10 gigabit core and you know all sorts of neat pretty fibers and new connectors I'd never dealt with and pretty boxes with blinky lights. I was really excited about that. I had ordered all the hardware and it was just about to show up and then we hired Tim. And that was a great starter project for Tim. And so I ended up not doing it and I was slightly sad, but I found other things to, uh, to uh, keep myself busy. We never get over the blinky light stage, by the way. It's I still go into the data center and just sit back, turn the lights out, and watch. Uh, and you know, speaking of changes and being flexible, uh, you might have heard that uh, Picnic was bought by Google, uh, this little search company in Mountain View. Um, and this happened uh, actually just a few months after I was brought on. Uh, uh, I didn't know, you know, when I started, and uh, our initial planning, of course, didn't revolve around this. Uh, but uh, we learned that uh, Google was interested in acquiring Picnic, and uh... so during our due diligence phase, uh, my boss Mike, the same guy that uh, was sort of my backup, swings by by uh, my cube, and he's like, "Hey, so with this Google thing that's going on, um, they kind of want to. They have this question, and they want to know uh, what it would take for us to be able to handle five times our current peak." And oh, by the way, could we do it in a month? <laughs> and uh, that's pretty much uh, struck fear into my heart. <laughs> and then uh, I didn't, that, that couldn't last very long because we pretty much had to, to uh, buckle down and just get on it. So uh, you know, we were flexible. Uh, we switched from this sort of long-term plan for improving the system. Uh, and uh, in the month leading up to the announcement, uh, we actually did uh, double, uh, possibly triple our capacity, depending on how you measure it. And uh, nearly every part of our system was, uh, basically before we started this process, nearly every part of our system was, was getting close to capacity, or at least close to our you know, comfort level. Uh, so we had to basically redesign and expand almost every, every piece, although, uh, I guess redesign is a little bit of strong. It's more expand every, every part of our system. Uh, everything had to grow. We were really good at capacity planning, and we knew that we had margin. It just happened that our margin was exactly the same across the entire system. Um, the, again, I think about single points of failure in new and interesting ways. Uh, capacity expansion is actually one of those. Um, so although Tim was actually pretty new to Picnic, um, he had a great background, and this is what's important about hiring solid people. And so we were actually able to sit down and um, truthfully we kind of threw some of the cross training out the door because we had a month to do a shitload of work. And so we were able to segment it and uh, we got it done. I mean we had pallet loads of servers arriving, um, we had new racks going in, we were bringing in new uh, fiber from colos and transit providers and uh, yeah we actually, we pretty much nailed it. Yeah it was a busy uh few weeks in there. Uh, but uh, basically, uh, so now, okay, we got through that. Uh, we're in the Google office in Fremont, uh, in Seattle. And, uh, Not Fremont, California. No. <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot going on. Uh, and uh, basically, it's a, it's a good thing that we did this expansion before we went, even though we didn't end up needing all that capacity, because now we can spend time uh, on you know, focusing on what we have to do at Google rather than on uh, trying to expand this capacity. Uh. Turns out there's actually a lot to do at Google. Um, what they don't tell you is there's this massive orientation thing, which is really cool, and then they just kind of blow your mind repeatedly with all these really neat things, um, 
and it's a little bit hard to stay focused on your actual day job, which is keeping this relatively large, um, by a lot of standards, site running and keeping it fresh and all that type of thing. And by like, by having all this ahead of time, um, and by having a person hired ahead of time, we're able to actually take on this task. Uh, more aggressively than we perhaps would have, which is migrating to the rest of, of uh, um, you know, Google infrastructure and just kind of really making things awesome and really kind of taking it to the next level. Um, so it's been really nice having another, another person around. Any questions? We have a few minutes left. Yeah, we actually went through this a little faster than we thought we would. Oh, come on. Oh, I see one over there. Um, neither of us were actually too closely involved in those discussions that were happening. Um, I mean, by the by the point we were basically asked to go go do this, go make it happen, and uh, pretty much we were heads down um, working on that. Um, my understanding that there really wasn't a, a huge amount of of direction either way, but I don't know. I I, I can add to that a little bit. Keep in mind that uh, you have. To you want to keep these kinds of acquisitions secret as long as possible, right, leading up to it. So uh, sharing too much information with your employees early on, you need to share stuff with them, but, but uh, you don't want to share all the details. And so uh, we really didn't uh, know until about a month uh, before, uh, and uh, even then we didn't have a lot of details. Um, also, uh, it, it doesn't happen until things are signed, right? So Google's not going to want to invest a lot of money in helping us prepare for this uh, when there's not anything signed yet, right? So. Anything else? Yeah, other questions? No? Oh, yeah, we're done here. Uh, drink more coffee. <laughs> um, that's that's a tough one. Um, when and I don't know if I, I so when I was hired, um, I I actually told them I I really didn't want to do ops. <laughs> um, I really don't want to do this for very long. I hope you get to a point where we can hire someone that can really do this and can do this well. Uh, and then every once in a while, come performance review time, they would, uh, guys would ask me, hey, so how you doing? I'm like, well, you know, I'm doing okay. I can do this for a little while longer, but I can see there'll be a point where we'll want to get someone. And uh, I think, I don't think I actually made the move on hiring someone. Um, I think it was basically, um, you know, Mike was like, well, we need to get someone else. And it might have been that time I took a vacation to a beautiful national park and, and the shit hit the fan when I was gone. And he realized he, he, couldn't, he couldn't do it. And so that was this, it was actually a wake-up call and not so much a fatigue thing. Um, but I was getting pretty tired. Um, I will say it helps to really like the people you work with. It makes it easier. Um, do you have any, anything to add? Well, to I, was, I was just about to add that, but you did. That uh, loving what you're doing is really important in, in there, and you're certainly going to get a lot. It, it's, it doesn't feel like work as much, right? So really important to like the people you're with, that you like the product and like what you're doing. And I, I actually took a, uh, we all took an opinion pretty early on that uh, if we were getting paged in the middle of the night, we were doing something wrong. Um, and the, the funny thing is things rarely break, in my experience. Things just rarely break randomly. Um, some things fail, but why not? But if a single failure causes you, if a single failure is critical enough to wake you up, then you did your job wrong. You should, you should fix that. So that, that, that was actually another thing I was, was going to add is that uh, if you build enough redundancy in the system, uh, so you've got emails that are alerting you when something's down because you know you need to go fix it because now you've just lost redundancy, but you're not going to page unless you're down to the point where one more failure is going to cause a, a catastrophic uh, issue. So uh, Picnic and Justin were very good about having that redundancy in the system uh, e even way before I got there. 
Uh, and I, I think that uh, allowed him to sleep more at night. It's still a big weight on your shoulders. Anything else? Yeah. <laughs> are you saying I should check my pager right now? Um, because yes, you are looking at the entire ops staff for Picnic. Um, we haven't hired anyone else. Um, we expect to get additional resources, um, uh, which is you know at least some stuff we won't have to worry about because that's provided by you know the the larger entity. Um, but I will say, if anyone's interested in working for us with us, uh, I'd be glad to talk to you. <laughs> yeah, pick, uh, Google is hiring for Picnic. Just, just, uh, yeah. Ask us later. Yes. <laughs> all the, all the above, all the above. Um, I would say that when we, when, when Tim started, we actually had a good couple weeks where we just went in the conference room and I just kind of spewed all over the whiteboard. And, um, and somehow you know, Tim managed to pick up a lot of that. And he actually wrote most of the documentation. Um, and it turns out that was a really great exercise for learning how things work. Um, and then we've also done it a good part of it's been a good chunk of it has been done in response to problems. So you know maybe uh, something will happen. We'll get paged bonus points if it's during work hours um, because we can both be there. And maybe I'll just jump in and fix it. And then we sit down and kind of do a post post mortem. Um, the previous speaker talked about that. Post mortems are awesome because that is a way to move forward your documentation. Um, so those are the two ways that that work best for me or yeah. for us. Let, let, me, let me just say one more thing about documentation. Uh, um, I find it really, uh, and I, I've done these kinds of cycles a few times, and I, I find it really uh, good for the documentation and good for the people who are trying to learn the system to, uh, for the, the new people coming in who are trying to learn it to be the ones who are improving the existing documentation or creating it if there is none, because you have to learn it to document it. And, and you can then hand that documentation to the new person when they come in, uh, and, and they all have questions, and you should encourage them to improve the documentation uh, because that way they really know it, and the documentation gets better for the next person. Well, we only have a couple minutes left, uh, so if there isn't any questions... Oh, I see hands way over. You mean like mapping, uh, like some places try to do a mapping of uh, some user metric to headcount type thing? Yeah. Right. Um, at Picnic, we didn't really have any sort of metric. Um, it, was, it was pretty much, a, at some point, someone, I raised my hand and said, I'm getting burned out or whatever. Um, we, should, we should hire someone else or we need to bring in redundancy. Um, yeah, and I, don't, I actually don't know how Google handles that. We had, a, we had a lot of servers at the end, though. I, it, you can try to have those kinds of metrics, but in, in my experience, it, uh, uh, you, you could come up with an average number that might apply across the industry, uh, but, but the, each individual case is so different. It's really just dependent on how are the people who are handling the systems doing now. Make sure that you're, you're looking at your future growth and, and you know what it's going to be, and you have a good gauge of how the people who are currently there are handling it, and that'll tell you when you need to hire that next person. Uh, I think it's a combination of, of uh, the acceptable risk stuff we were talking about and how much time people are spending. Are they overloaded, right? You don't want to burn out your only ops person. <laughs> It, that's a that's a bad thing, and and if you and if you make that mistake too many times in a row, uh, you're just increasing your risk. And they leave. Yeah. Uh, well, I have a couple quick announcements uh, right before we wrap up. And uh, first one is uh, let's see here. Um, so in the evening events, uh, six o'clock, uh, the exhibit hall reception is going to be in ballrooms E and F. Uh, this is where the vendors are. Uh, they're friendly people, and they don't normally bite. Um, and they will have, uh, like I said here, refreshments, which might actually mean beer. And then starting at 7.30 is the uh, Birds of a Feather. Uh, they are in uh, Napa 1, 2, and 3. Uh, I, look, I saw the list. It looks like they're pretty, uh, pretty extensive. Some neat ones going on. 
And uh, we start tomorrow at, I believe, 8.30. Um, you can always get here at 8 and be extra caffeinated so you're uh, ready to go for the keynote sessions tomorrow morning. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, thanks for coming.